prepare, prepare the way of the Lord. The Lord our God is coming soon. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus comes to us and offers his grace and love. It is good for us to repent of our sins and to plead for his mercy. Lord Jesus, you came to gather the nations into the peace of God's kingdom. Lord, have mercy. to strengthen us in holiness. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You will come in glory with salvation for your people, Lord, have mercy. God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Lord Jesus Christ and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first scripture lesson for this, the third Sunday in the season of Advent, is the Old Testament lesson for the day recorded in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evil doer will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. <clears throat> then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb, for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Here ends the first scripture lesson. We now hear the singing of the choir.
second scripture lesson is the lesson from the book of Acts, recording in Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. Here ends the second scripture lesson. Alleluia, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Alleluia. <laughs> Please rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 67. The Gospel lesson will serve as our sermon text for this morning. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. The hymn of the day is hymn 702 from the Christian Worship Supplement book. You may be seated. <laughs>
grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> the sermon text for today is the gospel lesson recorded in Luke chapter 1. I'll read the first two verses of the text. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. And we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I've lived in Lake Zurich for about 14, 15 years, and I have to say that I have learned quite a bit from the people, the families in Lake Zurich. And one of the things that I've learned is how to talk. I learned very quickly in interacting with the parents of kids that were in the same class as my kids or played on the same team, how to talk. Very quickly, Lake Zurich people will ask, so how are your kids? And then, of course, you reply, but then you also chime in and say, and by the way, how are your children? I learned from Lake Zurich parents that it's almost like a contest to see who can get that question in first. And I say I learned that because it doesn't come naturally. What comes naturally for parents? You want to talk about your own kids, right? And maybe you have had this happen to you where you ask someone, how, how are the kids? And then they tell you and that's it. They don't bother asking you, and how are your children? And you sit there kind of like, don't you want to know about me? Don't you want to know about my family? I learned this very quickly from the people in Lake Zurich, how to talk, how to start a conversation, to have that contest, to get that question in as quickly as possible. Tell me about the children. Can you tell me how the kids are? Of course, the Lake Zurich parents learned this from Zechariah from long ago from good old Zechariah, who had that visit from the angel Gabriel in the temple. Zechariah was told by Gabriel that he was going to be the father of John the Baptist despite his and his wife's old age. And Zechariah objected, how can this be? And Gabriel said, because you did not believe me, Zechariah lost his voice for a little over nine months. And then last week we heard that on the day of John the Baptist's circumcision, when he was eight days old, there was a question about the name of the child. And Zechariah put an end to that question when he wrote on a piece of paper, his name is John, the name given by the angel. And immediately his voice was restored to him and in last week's text from Luke chapter 1, we learned that Zechariah praised God by probably explaining in great detail what had happened to him, the visit of the angel and everything in connection with this child. But now in our text, we have before us a song that Zechariah sang. It's called the Benedictus which means bless, blessing. The word really is oilogia in the Greek. We have our English word eulogy, when you say something good about somebody. So Zechariah eulogizes, blesses the Lord. But as we take a brief look at his song, and there are so many wonderful gospel points in it to look at, let us see, talk, about the kids. Zechariah talks about the kids. He first of all talks about somebody else's kid, somebody else's son. He speaks in his song about Jesus, the Son of God. 
First of all, he says that Jesus is the son of David. And yes, that was part of God's promise that the Savior would come from the house and line of David. And Joseph, of course, was that legal father of Jesus. And so when the time came for that census to be taken and everyone to return to their hometown of origin, Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem, the city of David. The Son of God is also the Son of David. And Zechariah says, praise be to the God of Israel because this Savior has come and redeemed his people. It's interesting to me that that's in the past tense. Jesus hasn't redeemed anybody yet. But if God says something's going to happen, it's as good as done. Kind of like what Isaiah wrote in chapter 53 of his book, 500 years before Jesus was born, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. Jesus has redeemed his people, and to redeem, of course, means to pay a ransom price to set someone free, and that's usually an outlandish price. And of course, the price that Jesus paid was that outlandish price of his life in his blood, his blood spilled on the ground, poured out to redeem us. I have to confess that of late, you know, whenever I need something like a tool or a piece of furniture, I always go to, let's see, let go, offer up, Craigslist, these kinds of places. And I'm always interested to find out how much something means to somebody. If somebody has a tool that I would like and I offer them some super lowball offer and they accept it, I know what? It didn't mean much to them. They just wanted to get it out the door. I almost respect those people who say, here's the price and it's firm because it means something to me. And if you're going to get it, you have to pay this price. Jesus loved you so much that he was willing to redeem you, to pay that outlandish price of his very life and his very blood to redeem you, to ransom you from your enemies of sin and death and Satan and condemnation and this world. And this son of David, Zechariah calls the horn of salvation. A couple weeks ago we celebrated Thanksgiving and at Thanksgiving time we have on the altar a horn, a horn of plenty or a horn known as the cornucopia. But in biblical terms, the horn is a symbol for strength. If you have an animal and it's got a huge set of horns on it, oh boy, look out because that's a strong animal. Jesus is the horn of salvation. Though he comes weak and meek and mild and wrapped in strips of cloth and placed in a manger, he has more than enough ability and strength to accomplish your salvation. Zechariah sings about the Son of God, the Son of David. But Zechariah also sings about the Son of the Covenant or Promise. A covenant is a, a contract. And, you know, there are contracts like the one that was established at Mount Sinai, a two-sided covenant or contract where God said, I'll be your God if you act like my people. And because that depended on sinful people, that contract was immediately broken with the worship of the golden calf. But God makes his one-sided covenant or contract with a sinful world and says, I'm going to send my Savior into this world. No ifs, no ands, no buts, it's going to happen. Now, in our day and age, young people are often bashed, millennials, are bashed for being non-committal or having commitment phobia. And as I think about it, I, I get it, you know, if you take tiny baby steps, just slowly move your way towards something instead of diving in, then a person thinks, well, that'll be easier to retract myself, extricate myself from that situation. 
But you know what? That's not God-like. How did God act? Did he say, you know, I th I'll send the Savior if conditions are right, and if I'm not busy, and if he doesn't feel, if he feels like it, <laughs> that's not how God acted. I'm going to send the Savior. As a matter of fact, Zechariah says, God swore on oath to Abraham that through his family, all nations on earth would be blessed. And that family member, of course, is Jesus, and the blessing that he brings is life and salvation through his death on the cross. And since God cannot swear by anyone greater than himself, he swears by himself, declaring, I'm going to do this. Nothing's going to stop me. And finally, on the pre precipice of the Savior's arrival, Zechariah talks about someone else's kid, right? Talks about the Son of God, the Son of David, the Redeemer, the one who has come to rescue his people. God remembers his people. There's a friend of ours in Lake Zurich. His name is Pete. And yes, our kids played sports together. Our girls played on the same team, basketball team. And Pete is a, a finance guy. He does mortgages and refinancing, and so we're usually in contact with him. And every single time we talk to Pete, he remembers something about one of our kids, about one of our daughters in a basketball game at Stevenson High School, the hated rival. It doesn't matter, you can call him up and say, oh! So glad to talk to you, Pastor Bauer. Do you remember? It's like, yes, yes, Pete, I remember. There's a picture of, of him on my phone pointing to a scoreboard related to what one of our daughters did. He just can't get it out of his head. He just constantly is remembering this thing. He remembers a, a child. That's the way God is. God doesn't forget. God didn't forget about his promise to send the Savior. Zechariah and Elizabeth may have thought, has God forgotten about us? God didn't forget about them. At Christmas time, maybe there are people who are forgotten by relatives, by friends. God doesn't forget. Nobody's forgotten at Christmas time, right? No. The one who is called the Son of Righteousness, Jesus, arises and he has healing in his wings and he sheds light all over the place. The light of salvation through faith in him. And so now you and I can serve him freely and with joy, not as slaves who are trying to earn our way to heaven, but as children who rejoice in the truth that heaven has been won. Nobody's forgotten at Christmas because God remembers his people by sending his son to be the Savior. Okay, so Zechariah starts out by talking about the kids. He talks about somebody else's son, God's son. But now it's his turn, right? He has a chance to talk about his son, the son who is in his arms, his son named John the Baptist. And he says about his son, John the Baptist, that he will be a prophet of the Most High and that his job is to prepare the way for the Lord. Where did Zechariah get this information from? Well, he got it from our Old Testament reading and from the angel Gabriel. When Gabriel appeared to Zechariah in the temple, he said about John, he will be a joy and delight to you. Oh, that's nice. The arrival of a child will make life better and, and happier. And many will rejoice because of his birth. Oh, yeah, lots of friends and relatives came from the hill country of Judea to celebrate with Zechariah and Elizabeth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. From the get-go, John was supposed to live this Nazarite life, a life that was set apart for God in a very, very special way. And the angel said, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Perhaps you remember that when Mary went to visit Elizabeth and greeted Elizabeth, 
John the Baptist jumped in Elizabeth's womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and declared to Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Gabriel said about John, He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah spoke about his own son as a prophet of the Lord who had the special job of preparing the way for Jesus. And did you notice how John would prepare the way? By giving people the knowledge of salvation. If you were able to meet John the Baptist, you might say, this guy's a weirdo. I mean, look at how he dresses. Look at, he's got this really long hair. He's got a camel hair coat, leather belt. He's got this strange diet. He lives like a lunatic out in the wilderness instead of preaching in the temple courts. He's down by the Jordan and people have to go out to listen to him. But his job was to give people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Yes, John called people to repentance, and to repent means to have a change of mind. In other words, if the people came thinking that they were right with God because they observed the Sabbath and, and tithed and went to the temple for the major festivals, John said, your thinking is all, you've got to change your mind about that. You've got to realize that none of that counts before God. You've got to realize that what you need is a Savior, and oh, by the way, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And I think this is a very important point. How does God get people ready to meet the coming Savior? He does that by forgiving sin. Who can approach God's holy hill? Who can approach the mountain of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Where do you get that from? You get that from God. So God himself prepares you to meet the Savior by forgiving your sins. Isn't this the same thing that happens on a communion Sunday here? What is the preparation that you undergo prior to meeting your Savior in, with, and under the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. Isn't it by confessing your sins? Isn't it by the remission of sins, the absolution, the forgiveness of all of your sins? God himself prepares you to meet the Lord through the remission of sins. Zechariah talks about his own kid in the Benedictus. And who can blame him? God himself said that his son would be amazing, that he would have a special role, that he would be a prophet, prophet of the Lord. Now Zechariah by trade was a priest, and to be a priest you had to be a, a member of the tribe of Levi, and so that meant that John, of course, as his son, would be in the priest business. And so Zechariah says, however, he's going to be a prophet. And I wonder, you know, in those days if there wasn't maybe a little bit of rivalry between those types of service that were rendered to God and God's people, priests and prophets. There hadn't been a prophet on the scene since Malachi, 400 years earlier. I wonder if there was a little priest-prophet rivalry going on, kind of like in our church body. Sometimes there's this friendly little rivalry between pastors and teachers, all on the same team, but you know, a little rivalry. Maybe kind of like Army-Navy, all on the same team, but you know, there's kind of this friendly little rivalry. <coughs> Zechariah doesn't seem to have a problem with calling him a prophet of the Lord because he's just happy that the arrival of his son means that the arrival of the Savior 
is imminent. And what a glorious thing it is for him to have this small part in this plan of salvation. And by the way, in case you didn't notice it, even as he sings about his son, he very quickly reverts back to singing the praise of God's son. Talk about the kids, talk about the kids. At Christmas time, maybe you get those Christmas letters. Here's what happens in our house. If a nice Christmas letter arrives, my wife reads it, and then she summarizes it for me. She gives me that nutshell summation. Of, and usually, of course, in those letters, you have news about the kids. And that's all good and fine, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing to be able to speak about kids, to brag about kids. It's a great thing, isn't it? But I think we can learn from Zechariah an important lesson. Christmas is about talking about the kids, speaking about the kids, right? But first and foremost, whose son is the one that we speak about? Whose son is the one that we sing praises to and about? Isn't it God's son? Absolutely. Blessed be the Lord God, the Lord God of Israel, for he has redeemed his people in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We sing the creedal hymn.
we worship God with our offerings. Please rise. let us pray to the Lord asking that the Lord would have mercy. For the church on earth that her members would rejoice always in their salvation, pray without ceasing, sing your praises as Zechariah did long ago, and bear witness about the light of the world that is Jesus Christ, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For your people, that during this holy season we may always have on our lips talk about your Son, who is also the Son of David, the, the one who has redeemed his people from their enemies and now reigns as the horn of salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those that God has appointed to civic leadership, that they would govern wisely, administer justice fairly, and not abuse the authority that has been granted to them, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For those traveling this season to celebrate the nativity with family and friends, that they reach their destination safely, that their time with loved ones be joyful, and that they return home without incident, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For those who are hungry, homeless, unemployed, or find themselves in any kind of need, that they find food, shelter, and employment, and come to know and confess God as the giver of daily bread, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are ill, those recovering, and those who are homebound who cannot be with us, that they find comfort, healing, patience, and the sure knowledge that Jesus will never leave them or forsake them, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For those who have wandered from the faith, who falsely believe that there is no longer a place for them among God's people, or who are trapped in some faith and soul-destroying manifest sin, that they might, like the prodigal son, repent and be returned to your kingdom. 
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we join in praying. Our Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn 275, which is the Song of Zechariah. few announcements. First of all, uh, in about 15 minutes, we'll start with Sunday school and uh, adult Bible class. Sunday school meets in the fellowship hall and adult Bible class meets in the cafe. 
Today at 1.30, the preschool Christmas program uh, will be held here at church, and, and uh, all the members of New Life are invited to attend that. The program lasts around 20 minutes, and then there's something to eat after uh, the program. And confirmation class will be held at 6 p.m. Um, this evening. Outreach is scheduled to meet on Tuesday at 7, and men's Bible class will meet at 11.30 uh, on uh, Wednesday. On Saturday, there will be a, a rehearsal for the Sunday School Christmas Eve Day uh, uh, program, and that's from 9 to 10.30 in the morning. And then you have included in the bulletin the schedule for our Christmas services. The children's service is in place of the normal Sunday morning service at 9.30 a.m. There will be a Christmas Eve candlelight service of nine lessons and carols at 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve. On Christmas Day, there's a Christmas Day carol communion service, and that's pushed back an hour to 10.30. And then our New Year's Eve Day service is the following Sunday at the normal time, which is 9.30. Uh, next uh, Sunday after the kids' uh, service, there's also going to be a mini uh, Christmas for kids with activities for parents and kids that can be done together in place of Sunday school. If you'd like to purchase a poinsettia for uh, adorning the Lord's chancel, there's a sign-up sheet. Uh, you can sign up and pay downstairs on the bulletin board, and today is the last day uh, for doing that. In your bulletin, you have a Christmas card that you can use to invite people to our uh, Christmas services, and uh, the elder and I were talking about specific people who haven't been here for a while. And if you uh, have knowledge and remember those people, use the card and you can invite them to uh, join you on Christmas uh, to worship the newborn king. Yeah, offering envelopes for 2018 have been assigned and they're on the table in the entryway as well. Finally, today is the third Sunday of the month. We usually watch the Wells Connection uh, video tape and um, so we're going to do that right now.